So this morning we're in Hebrews chapter 9. If anyone needs a Bible, just let us know. You can raise your hand. And, okay, great. And Doug would be happy to hand you all a Bible right there. And so, you know, as we've been studying in the book of Hebrews, the author here is writing about the superiority of Jesus Christ. We talked about how Jesus was superior to angels. Jesus was superior to prophets. Then one section, he talked about how Jesus was superior to Moses and to Abraham. Last week, we went through and we talked about the old covenant, the law, versus the new covenant, grace. How grace is much superior than trying to stick with the law. We shared that none of us, as we read through the Ten Commandments, the Old Testament, none of us would be capable of fulfilling those commandments on a day-to-day basis successfully. So therefore, if you're going to be saved by the law, then that means also if you don't live up to it or fulfill it, that means you're going to be condemned by the law. God gave the Israelites promises. He says, if you will obey the laws, you will be blessed. And as we've seen, the Israelites, they tried to live up to it oftentimes. When they did live up to it, then God blessed them. But what happened after a while? Then they would take and they would start doing their own thing, and walking away from the Lord. And as they walked away in disobedience, then the blessings were removed from them. Then when they got so far back, and they were down and out, then they would go back to the Lord, and then He would bring them back to Him. And we shared how wonderful that is, that we serve a God, that when we do get sidetracked, He stands there with open arms and welcomes us back. Now, it's interesting because the Christian believers, such as you and and I today, we are citizens of two worlds, the earth and the heavenly. Jesus says over Matthew chapter 22, verse 21, he says that we need to render the things to Caesar, earthly things that we owe the government to Caesar, but also that we're to give to God the things that are God's. So that says that you and I are citizens here for a short time. But we know that our heavenly home, our eternal home, is in heaven. This is only temporary where we are now. But while we are here on earth, we're to be obedient to the laws of the land while we're here. Uh, But because you and I are citizens of two different worlds, you and I have to learn how to walk in the world that we don't see which is faith. And that is very difficult to do because oftentimes when you and I cannot see things beyond us, we have a tendency to see what's around us. And as we see the different things that are around us, we have a, ten- we have a tendency to give in to them and be pulled away from our walk with the Lord. So we need to, at all times, be focused on the Lord, who He is. That is one time when we are told that uh, not to get our heaven out of the clouds. Have you heard people say, oh, just get your head out of the clouds. Well, no, Jesus says, keep your head in the clouds. Keep your mind focused on me and on the things above. As a matter of fact, keep your place right there in Hebrews chapter 9. But over in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24, this is the way you and I need to walk. And he gives us Moses here as an example. He says, by faith, Moses, when he came of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Then look at verse 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. That is an example for you and I. Like Moses, we have to see the invisible if we're going to overcome the power or the tug of the worldly things around us while we're here on earth. The earthly man says, seeing is believing. How many times have we all heard that? But the spiritual man says, believing is seeing. So you and I, if we're going to do a faith walk while we're here on earth, you and I need to constantly be thinking about our Lord in heaven. We need to be thinking about the promises that He gives to us, but also the commandments that He gives to us. As you and I follow the word He gives to us, we are obedient. As we are obedient, then we are blessed. 
But it's a challenge to do that because we're believing in something that we haven't seen. But as we're going to see today, this is what we're called to do. We know that Jesus is in heaven. He's a priest over the heavenly sanctuary. And we're going to talk about that more this morning. So the principle of faith that we're going to go over in this section of scripture here. It says that you and I were to believe about heavenly things. How many of us have a hard time doing that? I know there's times when, when, when I admit I do, there's very different times when I say, you know what? Lord, I know that as I do my day-to-day walk with you, I know oftentimes I don't see you. I know oftentimes that I feel that maybe I don't feel the Lord's presence with me. And as a tendency, I have a, if I'm not careful, I'll start walking in the flesh. But then I have to keep in mind that the Lord says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So that tells me that the Lord is with me no matter what, how I feel, no matter what day of the week or no matter what night it is of the week. But as I'm walking the walk of faith, to keep my eyes focused on the Lord. You know, you and I have never seen this heavenly sanctuary, but yet we're to believe what the Bible says about it. Now, in Hebrews 9, it pre- uh, presents really a contrast between the Old Covenant and The old sanctuary, the tabernacle, then a new covenant, the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus now ministers. And this contrast makes it clear that the new covenant is much superior. So here we see, keep in mind that the whole book of Hebrews, the author is trying to encourage these Hebrew believers, these Hebrew Christians that come out of Judaism. Now they're having a tendency to start to go back into Judaism And then the author of Hebrews, he's trying to encourage them, don't go back into the Old Testament laws. The thing that you have now is much better, much superior. So don't go back into your old walk. I'll just share this with you. How many times since you've been a Christian has the devil come along and says, now that you've become a Christian, life's not as much fun. Now that you've become a Christian, there's more challenges in your life. Oftentimes when a person prays to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, they think that everything's going to be just hunky-dory. But if you've been walking in the faith, you know that that's not the case. But then the devil will come along and he'll say, you know what, it was much better where you were before, before you became this Christian. That's exactly the feeling that's tugging on here, on these new Hebrew Christians. They're wanting to be tugged back in to the Old Testament, which was the law, and it's not going to work. So let's get right into chapter 9, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared. The first part, in which was the lampstand, the table. The, uh, I'm sorry, the, the first part, which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second bell, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, and which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the table of the covenant, or tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat of these things, which we cannot speak in detail. Just to kind of start out here with, This author, he's kind of describing the tabernacle of the old covenant, the earthly sanctuary. The Lord had instructed Moses over in the book of Exodus in chapter 26. The Lord told Moses, he said, Moses, I want you to establish a place where I can meet with the people. And I can just imagine that if you go over to chapter 26, you'll see there where the Lord had given Moses the instructions when he was to make the earthly tabernacle, which was like a big tent. The Lord said, here's the measurements. Here's how I want you to make everything. Can you imagine what Moses had to think when the Lord gave him the measurements and then Moses probably scratched his head and he says, but Lord, there's three million of us. How are we all going to fit in there? It's interesting. Because the Lord knew that over a period of time that not every one of them would be showing up. This 
earthly sanctuary that he's talking about. Some translations call it tabernacle. Some call it a sanctuary. It was ordered by God. It was for a divine worship. But it was only an earthly sanctuary. It was built like a tent, a tent-like structure. So here we see the very first part that he talks to there in verse 2. He talks about the first part. What he meant by that was when you first walked in through the tabernacle. Set it up, it was in a square shape. A guy would come out, he would bring his animal when he was going to ask for forgiveness of sins. That's what they did in the Old Testament. When a person had sinned, they wanted to go ask for forgiveness, they had to bring like a bull or a goat with them. They would bring that with them and then they'd go to the tabernacle. There was only one gate that went into it and that was on the east side. So when they walked through the gate, the very first thing they seen was what they called the altar of burnt offerings. It was like a, a pit that was built. And on the top of the pit, it was it had a crate laying over it, like a grill type. And on each corner, on the four corners, it had a horn that stuck off each corner. What they did was they would take the animal when the person that, the person that was going to confess and they would bring it, then they would give it to the priest. Then the priest would take that animal, they would put it up on top of that uh, the altar... The sacrifices, they would tie it up to each corner and then they would sacrifice the animal there. Then once you left that area, then you would walk through and then there would be a basin where then they could wash your hands. And then they went to the first sanctuary. This first sanctuary was called the holy place. The holy place. And whenever you went inside the holy place there... That's where the priests did their day-to-day ministry. Now, what kind of ministry did they do? Well, inside the tabernacle, in the first place there, they would go in there every day, and they would trim the lamps, trim the wick on the lamps, because the lamps burn with oil and stuff. So the, this was a priest's job. He would go in every day. Not only did he sacrifice animals, but he would go into the holy place. He would trim the lamps. The lamps were to never go out. They were to constantly be burning 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Then he would leave there after trimming the wicks. Then he would go over to the altar of incense and replace fresh incense up on the altar. As the incense went up, that was a belief, that was a symbol of the prayers of the people going up to God. Then the third thing that they would do is they had what they called the table showbread. Then they would take and they would bring in fresh bread without what? Without yeast in it, right. And yeast represents what in the Bible? Without sin. So they'd bring in fresh bread, 12 loaves on the Sabbath. They had two rows of six. And what they would do is on that day, the priest would then go in and replace everything. That was some of the daily chores. They thought that by doing these things, that it was going to be, it would make man more acceptable to God. And that was the daily priest. That was his job that he did on a continuous basis. So as we see, he would go inside. Now keep in mind, in this first area here, this first sanctuary, the outer sanctuary, it's the same thing. There's different names for it. But as he would go into this area, the high priest could go in there, but also the daily priest could go in there. Both of them could enter enter this certain part of the tabernacle. But the biggest job that the priest did on a daily basis was helping sacrifice animals. This was a way to make man more acceptable to God. They tried to do everything possible to do this. And then all of a sudden, then there's a second sanctuary. So you walk in, first place you go is to the altar where you burn all, uh, your sacrifices. Then you would go into the courtyard, then you go through the courtyard, then you would get to the outer sanctuary where those three items were held. And then there was a veil. And then you would go through that veil and go into the inner sanctuary. That's what they called the Holy of Holies. Most holy place. So you had two compartments. The holy place, and then the most holy place. The most holy place, once they went in there, uh, this was... uh, the place where, where God's presence dwelt in the most holy place. Now, it's kind of interesting because in that room, an everyday priest could not go in. He could only go in to the outer sanctuary. But on the inner sanctuary, the only person that could go in there was the high priest himself. 
He could only go in there once a year. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But once you get inside this area, there was no lights, no windows, but the room would be lit up by the presence of God, by the glory of God. That glory of God is called a Shekinah glory. That means the presence of God. And it was believed that the presence of God would give that room illumination. Amen. That's right. And inside this room, inside the inner sanctuary or the most holy place, inside there contained three different things. One of them was the, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, covenant. This was like a chest or a trunk. Now, it's really interesting because this chest or trunk, the whole lid of it was solid gold. And it's called the mercy seat. Now, on this mercy seat through here, it contained three different items inside the ark. One of it was the two stone tablets, the Ten Commandments. Remember what else was in it? Aaron's rod. And manna, a jar of manna. Manna was the food, the bread that God had supplied. When Remember when the Egyptians went out of Egypt? And they left and they were out in the wilderness and they were crying for food. They said, Moses, what, did you bring us out here to starve to death? And the Lord provided manna. So what they did was they kept the two tablets, the Ten Commandments, inside the ark. They also kept the jar with manna and they kept Aaron's rod inside of it. Now, on top of the, that was down inside the Ark of the Covenant. The top we said was the mercy seat. Then on top of the mercy seat were two cherubims. And they kind of leaned over and they touched like this. Right in between the cherubims on the mercy seat was the presence of God. Powerful. Keep in mind, that place could only be entered once a year. And upon this mercy seat was that the blood of the sacrifice was to be sprinkled. And that was symbolizing that God could only be approached by the sacrifice of a life. When the priest, when they sacrificed an animal, and they brought in and they sprinkled the blood, that's how they approached God, or how God was approached. Because it takes a life or the sacrifice. Who gave the ultimate life? That's right, Jesus Christ. He shed his blood for you and I. Now, let's go ahead and let's look at verse 6. So, do you understand now how he talks about the tabernacle and the different compartments? But it's kind of interesting because he goes to verse 6 right there, and then all of a sudden he says, of these things we cannot speak in detail. And he stopped. <laughs> so today, that's all you're going to hear about that area. Because he stopped. <laughs> so look at verse 6. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Now keep in word, ignorance does not mean stupid in the Bible. Ignorance means oftentimes lack of knowledge, okay? So it says here that uh, he carried in the blood and he offered it for the people's sins, committed in ignorance. In verse 8, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who, pour, uh, who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. Here we see he's talking about the limitations now. He talked about the earthly tabernacle. Now he's talking about the limitations of the earthly service. And it says here that the most holy could only be entered once a year, and that was by the high priest only. So now in the holy place, a priest or an everyday priest could go in it. But into the holy of holies, the most holy place, that inner sanctuary could only be going into one time a year. And that one time a year, it could only be entered by the high priest himself. No one else. Now, as we said earlier, inside this room, there was no kind of lamps, no windows. This is where the glory of the Lord was manifested at. 
the high priest went into offered the blood of the sacrifice to God for the ignorance of the sins of the people. Now remember, they came day to day and offered sacrifices in the courtyard. But yet this one time a year, they came in and they offered the sins as for uh, uh, forgiveness of sins of the whole nation. So that day to day forgiveness was for each individual but that once a year it was for the entire nation. Is everybody with me on that so far? Okay. So this one day a year was what they called the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. It was the tenth day of the seventh month on the Jewish calendar, which in our calendar would be late, late, late in September. So this was like a nationwide confession for the sins of Israel. That's over in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 33 in the Old Testament. Now, instead of this blue and violet robe that the priest would normally wear, this particular day on the Day of Atonement, he would wear a solid white robe. What does white represent? Purity. Exactly. So this one day, that would be the linen the special linen that the high priest would wear. He would enter into this sanctuary now two times. Once a year, but on that one day, he would go in two separate times. What he would do is the first time he would carry the blood of a bull that had been sacrificed. So he would take the blood of that bull, he would go inside the inner sanctuary, he would sprinkle it there on the mercy seat, This was for the forgiveness of, first of all, for himself and his family. Now, keep in mind, this high priest was what? He was an everyday man like you and I. How many of us know that just because you're a priest or you're a pastor or a minister, whatever you want to say, you're not perfect. You're flesh. You have sins just like everybody else has sins. So the first thing that this high priest had to do, he had to go get right with the Lord before he could go first and then go uh, before and stand before for for the people. So he would go in with the bull, the blood of the bull. He would sprinkle it there on the altar. Then he would turn around and he would walk back outside. And then he would take, and they would bring two goats. Then they would take the first goat. Then they would take a sacrifice to that goat. Then they would give him the blood. Then he would re-enter back into the inner sanctuary. Then he would take and sprinkle the blood of the goat for the sins of the nation of the people committed in their ignorance. So two times he went in, once a year, but two separate times he walked inside. The first time was a bull for forgiveness for him and his family. The second time was for the sins of the nation of Israel. Then when he got through with that second time, then he would turn around and walk back out. Then they would bring him the second goat. Then he would take the second goat. He would lay his hand on the head of the goat. And what was that a representation of a symbol? A transfer of sins. By him laying his head on that goat, And by him saying, uh, as for forgiveness for the nation of Israel, when he got through, then they would take the goat and they would release the goat outside the camp. Back out into captivity for the goat to never return. That was a symbol that the sins of the people had been forgiven, went out of the camp to return no more that their sins had been forgiven. So when they got through with this, the high priest, then he would take and he would walk back out. And when he walked back out, the people, yeah, 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 he started clapping, singing praises to the Lord. When the priest came back out, that was a symbol that their sins had been forgiven. Now, back in that day, when the priest went in that once a year day of atonement to the inner sanctuary, they tied a rope around his ankle. So that if he was in there and the Lord did not forgive the sins, and when they quit hearing the the swishing of the robe, and they had like pomegranates and bells and things on the bottom, if they did not hear any rattling, that meant the Lord didn't forgive their sins. And they struck the priest dead, the high priest dead. Then, but they knew they could not go inside the inner sanctuary, so what they would do is they would take the rope and they would drag the priest out of it. Because they knew they could not go in there because that was only for a high priest only. So when he walked out, that was a representation that the sins had been forgiven. So the people were happy. They would start jumping, shouting, praising the Lord, singing and and worshiping God. And that was the, the duties that took place there. That's powerful, isn't it? So we see that the entrance into the Holy of Holies where God's presence was... Uh, was off limits to everyone, Israelites and everyday priests, 
The only person that could go into the inner sanctuary was the high priest himself. Now, in verse 8 there, it talks about the Holy Spirit. It's very, very interesting because when it talks about this, it's indicating there that the concept that the Old Testament passages that were describing this tabernacle and the sacrifices, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was teaching that sin had created distance between man and God. And that man must approach God then through a mediator. You know, there's people that do not like to admit that sin separates you from God. Sin separates. So when sin separates, we need a mediator between man and God. That's what this high priest was doing here. He was going, he was like their mediator between the Israelites and God himself. But And that mediator could only approach God through the blood of a sacrificial victim, an animal. You know, it was a lesson that the Holy Spirit was trying to teach that the way into God's presence had not yet been opened. Had not yet been opened. Because keep in mind, the Lord Jesus Christ hadn't come at that time. And we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. Though this Day of Atonement here, they're talking about the sacrifices, but what they did, they provided comfort, it says, for the conscience stricken. Now, when you and I, when our conscience is making us feel guilty about something, what can you and I do? We go to the Lord, right? We go to Jesus. But keep in mind, back in that day, Jesus hadn't been there yet. So through this sacrificial blood that was sacrificed for the forgiveness of the sin, wasn't complete. Since they had to do it daily, and then once a year, it was a remedy. It was not a permanent thing. Notice, the priest went in once a year, year in, year out, every year. So it was only temporary at that particular time, for that one present time. But now the honest worshiper, they knew that by their conscience, their conscience would tell them that they could not be made into a perfect person and cleanse their conscience by offering gifts, offering the sacrifices of animals. The Holy Spirit wouldn't allow them that type of forgiveness yet. It was by the sacrifice of the blood of an animal. But the problem was, these were all earthly acts. Everything that they did was earthly. And since it was earthly, the scripture says that these were only a shadow or a faint copy of the things that were to come. We talked in Hebrews uh, last week about this earthly tabernacle is only a shadow of the heavenly tabernacle. How many of us know that when something is just a shadow or a copy of it, it's not as good as the genuine thing? And that's the point that it's trying to get across right through here. So these acts, these earthly acts, they can't remove guilt and make a person perfect. Even keeping the Old Testament, it says there, the dietary laws, the ceremonial cleansings, These different things had to be kept until Christ came. It was their way of worshiping God and asking for forgiveness until the perfect sacrifice had been given. Are are y'all with me so far? It was an earthly thing. But now let's get in and, and let's see what it says here in the next part of the scriptures in verse 11 about this heavenly sanctuary. Now keep in mind, we've been talking about the earthly tabernacle, earthly sanctuary. Now let's get into the heavenly one. In verse 11, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and the more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place three times. That's right. It says once. Now, see, that's why you need to bring a Bible. (laughs) So you can verify what I'm saying. (laughs) No. But, I mean, I just wanted us to get that point across. That's why I said that. Notice, 
He didn't go in, come back out, go in, come back out. No, one time. So if you highlight or underline your Bible, go ahead. That he did this once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Verse 13, For at the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So here we see in this area, regardless of the significance that he's talking about here about the ashes of a heifer. At that time, they would take a red heifer, they would burn the heifer until there was just ashes. Then they would take the ashes and mix it with water. And then when a person had sinned, then they would take these ashes and they would put it on the person. That was like a way of cleansing them. And that's how they did it. And so here he's talking about that was the way that they would take and cleanse somebody. But that was only cleansing what? The outside. The outside of a person. So here the author is getting ready to make a comparison. He was saying that, hey guys, that the ashes of a heifer has such power to cleanse one from the most serious sins of that time that was going on. This was an outward defilement. <laughs> That's just what it was doing. It was cleansing only outwardly. But where does sin originate? From within. From within a person. And he was saying right through here, how much more powerful is the blood of Christ to cleanse from inward out. You see where he's going with this? Everything that they were doing at the earthly sanctuary, when they were cleansing the people, it was only cleansing them from outside. Jesus Christ come, he took his blood, he died for you and I, by you and I accepting him as our Lord and Savior, he comes and lives within us, right? The Holy Spirit comes and resides within you and I. Well, guess what? Then you start to being cleansed from the inside out. As opposed to just outside only. So he's trying to make a very strong point through here. That since Christ came. He took his blood. He was the perfect lamb of God. Without blemish. And he shed his blood for you and I. So he's talking about here. That the Christ of blood is much superior. Than the ashes of the heifer. Now. This heavenly sanctuary. He says then it's not man made. Uh, it's not part of this. Uh, uh, the heavenly sanctuary is not made with material things, so therefore it's not going to rust or corrode or, or decay or anything. This heavenly sanctuary is not a shadow or a copy, but it's the real thing. It's the place where the very presence of God Himself dwells now. That's where Jesus is right now. We talked about in Hebrews chapter 8 that God, what is He doing right now? It says that He... Descended, he went to heaven, and he seated down, or sat down, at the right hand of God. We said the right hand represents power and authority. So what was God doing, or was he doing there in heaven right now? Well, the scriptures was very clear. It told us one of the things that Jesus does right today in heaven, is he accepts a person when they come to heaven. Also, he says, sir, and he pleads on your behalf and my behalf, when you and I cry out for mercy and forgiveness... He hears your prayers and my prayers. That's why when we prayed here before the service, we thank you that we have a God who not only hears our prayers, but he answers our prayers. So he's interceding for you and I. So Jesus in heaven, where he's at right now, he's interceding for you and I. He's reigning over heaven, but he's also reigning over earth itself. Now you may look around, you may say, well, boy, you pick up newspaper, it don't look like he's reigning doing very much because times are pretty bad around here when you read about everything going on. Things are not falling apart. Things are coming together. Just as the scripture says. All these things must take place in order for that time to happen when he returns again. But none of this is by surprise. The Lord knows, he knows everything. He knows everything that's taking place. So here we see that, the, that uh, Jesus did not sacrifice the blood of an animal for the sins of you and I. He offered up his life as a sacrifice for you and I. Now we see there in verse 12, it says, Jesus entered into the Holy of Holies 
of heaven itself. But note, he had to enter only once and ask you to highlight that or underline it because his sacrifice was the perfect gift. No further sacrifices were needed. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. His life, his sacrifice, it stood for every person of every generation. His death made it possible for everyone to be forgiven. When you and I are forgiven, then we can be brought back into a right fellowship with God. We said that sins separate us from God. As a matter of fact, over in Psalms, it says our sins make God turn his face. But when we ask for forgiveness, he looks about on us again. So when you and I sin and our sins separate us from God, Jesus' blood He sacrificed for you and I. When you and I invite him into our life, our sins have been forgiven. Now that our sins are forgiven, you and I can be in a right fellowship with the Lord. How many times have you been doing something you know you shouldn't be doing? This may, you may be walking in it for a week or two weeks. While you're walking in in this thing that you should not be, and you felt guilty about it, did you find it hard to commune with God, to fellowship with God? Sure you did. Because the Holy Spirit that's living inside of you was pricking your heart. It was convicting you. But have you ever noticed that when you ask the Lord for forgiveness and you felt cleansed, then you felt like you could go to the Lord in prayer with no problem whatsoever. As a matter of fact, all the times you, you prayed like you never prayed before. And it comes strictly through the blood of Christ that you and I have that forgiveness. He was the perfect sacrifice. Jesus desires that you and I do this. And the reason why is so that you and I can serve him with joy and happiness. Have you tried doing things for the Lord when you're not walking right with the Lord? It's tough. Very tough. But he says, I want you to be forgiven. I want you to be cleansed. That way, when you're cleansed, you're in the right fellowship with me. When you're in the right fellowship with me, then you serve me gladly with joy. And that's exactly what he desires from you and I. He says, you can do this and not feel any shame whatsoever because you've been cleansed by the blood. You know, a lot of times people say, you know, that Bible that you read, and I've heard this many times. It's a bloody book. I tell you what, this book here is bathed in blood. The blood of Christ. Whether you start out and you read from Genesis or you go through to Revelation, it's about the blood of Christ. Because if you haven't been washed by the blood, you haven't been washed. It says that when you and I accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we've been cleansed by the blood. And if you haven't been cleansed by the blood, you're not saved. It's just the way it is. That's right, amen. (laughs) So here we see that there's also, you know, there's something I want to share with you. There's no, nothing that you could do, no part of sin in your life that God cannot forgive. That ought to be an amen. So there's nothing that you could do that God cannot forgive. So no matter what's going on in your life, if you go and you ask the Lord for forgiveness, you know that you can be forgiven. And that is, comes from internal, from within side. And that's exactly the point he's trying to make. Now, the thing is, this type of forgiveness, this type of cleansing, it could never have been done by the ashes of a heifer. It could never have been done by just ceremonial washings. It could never have been done by trying to adhere to the dietary laws of that time. Because that time, you couldn't eat food on a certain day of the week. You couldn't eat certain kinds of animals. None of that is from inward. All that was external. But keep in mind, that was the law that the Lord had given them at that time. And they were to be obedient to the law and to something better come along that the Lord had sent. And that's why the Lord gave them the new covenant. We said last week, the old covenant is law, outward duties, outward good works, trying to keep the laws. New covenant is grace. Nothing that we earn, nothing that we deserve. You didn't get saved by your good works. Ephesians 2, 8, 2, 9 says, For by grace have you been saved through faith. Not that of yourselves, but it is a gift of God so that no one can boast. Just the mere fact that you're sitting here this morning is the grace of God. That he has you here. 
That's powerful when we think about it. But under this old Levitical system, none of these things that you and I can experience today could have been done through the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Look at verse 15. Now, I've been sharing with you for the last several minutes, none of this stuff could have been fulfilled through the Old Covenant. So what happened to the guys of the Old Testament? (laughs) To the saints? Because Christ hadn't come yet. So how were the Old Testament saints saved? I hear that question a lot. People say, well, if we believe in Jesus Christ, and yet a lot of times in the Old Testament, it wasn't made clear to a lot. How were they saved? Faith. We're getting ready to see right through here. Look in verse 15. And for this reason... He is the mediator of the new covenant, talking about Jesus, by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. Those that were trying to keep the law. Now look at the rest. That those who are called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. Verse 16. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the tester. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the tester lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wall, hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Verse 20 saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. So here we see, Jesus is the mediator of this new covenant. His death was necessary. Now remember, a mediator is a person. He's a middle person. He's a go-between. Jesus is the go-between God and you and I. Now, what qualified believers before the death of Christ to be saved? These Old Testament saints. Well, we see that they were offering the blood of an unblemished animal. They were anticipating the coming of Christ and His death for sin. In other words, they were looking forward at the cross like you and I do what? We look backwards at what He did. We looked what He had did in the past for you and I, whereas they look forward to what He was going to do for you and I. So, now think about this. In a sense, God saved these Old Testament people on credit. In a sense, (laughs) on credit. Have you ever gotten a letter in the mail from a credit card company telling you that you've been pre-qualified? These letters usually tell you that you can spend like $5,000 because they've already checked you out and decided that you would be a good customer. Have you gotten those? I get about one a week. In the mail. God had already pre-qualified these Old Testament saints for righteousness. Unlike the trickery of the credit card companies, God had pre-qualified them by applying the righteousness of Christ to their accounts. Think about that. God gave these people some type of revelation of Him throughout the Old Testament. It was what they did with that revelation that determined that they would be saved or not. Just like what you and I do with the revelation that he's given you and I. People hear it today, but does that mean everybody accepts it? Absolutely not. But those that do accept it, what's he doing? He's applying it to your account. Does that make sense? So the Old Testament, they were saved... By the righteousness of Christ, it pre-qualified them because they looked forward the way that we look back. That's powerful when you think about that. Powerful. 
let me explain it a little different way. They were justified by faith, is what it was. Just as you and I are. They look forward to the cross as you and I look back to the cross. God reckoned the value of the work. Then he applied it to their account. It says that Abraham believed. He believed God. So God counted it as righteous. It's exactly what he does with you and I. In a sense, this debt of sin had accumulated under the old covenant, but by Jesus' death, he redeemed the believers of the former dispensation, the former covenant, the old covenant. He had redeemed them from their sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus met the demand that had to be met in order to apply this. And Jesus did that. He's the perfect mediator. In ancient times, it says that every covenant that was made, it was signed, sealed, made a done deal by the blood of an animal. That's how they took care of business back in that day. The blood was a pledge that the terms of the covenant would be fulfilled. Now, why blood? Why does it always talk about blood in the Bible? Because there's no greater symbol of life than blood. Blood's what keeps you alive. Blood is what keeps me alive. There can be no remission without blood. Now, think about this. For those that are Bible students that like to look at things a little bit deeper, this really presents a problem for the Jews today. Because keep in mind, ever since the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70, the Jewish people were no longer allowed to sacrifice in the temples. Now, if these Jewish people are no longer able to sacrifice an animal, and they go by their old covenant, it said that they had to sacrifice an animal, and they can't, and they don't accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, what happens? They can't be saved. If they do not believe in Jesus Christ, they cannot be saved. So these Old Testament Jews, they, can't, they couldn't sacrifice animals. Then they rejected the Savior. Now, I'm not saying all Jews. I'm talking about the Jews that had never accepted Jesus Christ. There's born-again Jews. But the Jews that never accepted Christ, that means they rejected Him. Either you accept or you reject. There's no in the middle. Just like with you and I. Either you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior or you deny Him as your Lord and Savior. There's no middle of the road. So therefore, with these Jews, they're being condemned by their own scriptures because the law demanded a sacrifice and they can't offer a sacrifice. So therefore, they're without hope. But look at verse 23. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but in heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another, he then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now... Once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Verse 28, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So here we see in the rest of chapter 9, he's getting ready, this author, he's uh, doing some comparing and contrast to two covenants. First of all, he talks about the earthly tabernacle, which was a copy or a shadow. It had to be purified with the blood of bulls and goats. This was a ceremonial cleansing. It's exactly what it was. But the heavenly sanctuary is reality. That's where Christ is today. It had to be cleansed 
it says, with better sacrifices. Now, that's with the sacrifice of Christ. Now, stop and think about this. How many of you would ever think that heavenly places would even need to be purified? Good question, isn't it? I'm glad you asked that. Where does sin originate? In heaven. Who originated it? Lucifer. Because he wanted all the recognition. He wanted to be worshipped. So it says that he was casted out of heaven. Him and how many of his angels went? A third. Were cast out. Now, stop and think about this. In the book of Job, when the devil, Satan himself, when he went, he approached God, and he told God that Job was obedient to him because of the way that he was being blessed. God told the devil, Satan, Job would honor me and bless me even if he didn't have those things. Now, when we read the scriptures, where did the devil keep visiting? He kept going back before the Lord, didn't he? Remember that in the book of Job? So, if Satan enters into heaven, is it pure? No. It had to be cleansed. Cleansed by the blood of Christ. That's exactly what he's talking about right through here. What is, let me ask you a question. When Satan keeps bopping back and forth there in heaven now all the time, in Revelation, what does it say that he's trying to do? He's trying to accuse the brethren. He's trying to, he's trying to go get permission to come after you and I. If you're curious about that, it's Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Sometime when you get a chance, sit down and read it. So the blood of Jesus was necessary to purify and sanctify heaven. This is important because Jesus did not make repeated offerings as Aaron the high priest had to do. Remember, he went in year in, year out, every year? No, Jesus, it says he went how many times? Once. One time. He's appearing in heaven right now, according to verse 24, and he promises to return according to verse 28. Then he's going to raise us up to eternal life. Those that are looking for his return those who've accepted Him as their Lord and Savior, and then He's going to take us to heaven where sin's not even going to be known of. That's powerful. That ought to be an amen for us. <laughs> it's interesting here because He keeps talking about death and things. You know, you and I might avoid a lot of things in life. You might avoid paying taxes. You might avoid uh, going out of town. You might avoid... Uh, certain foods. You might avoid a lot of things, but there's something that you're not going to avoid, and that's death. Unless you're still alive when the Lord returns, but if you're not still alive when the Lord returns, you're going to have to face death. It's a promise. It's a guarantee. It's going to have to happen. You know, people, they, they we live today as if there's not going to be any type of a death in our lives. But it's very, very interesting because there's a lot of things that you and I are going to have to face while we're here on earth. Death is going to be one of them. So as we see in this text, death is not the end. What's after death? Judgment. Judgment. Some people believe in reincarnation. But what does this verse says? It's appointed to men to die, as it say, six times, four times, eight times, many times. It says in this verse that a man is going to die how many times? Once. <laughs> Once. So when people ask you if you believe in reincarnation, according to God's word, no, there's no such thing. It's not scriptural. But if your faith has been placed in Christ, your sins were taken upon Him, and you're going to be judged on the cross, so you will die, but you won't have to face judgment. And I'm going to explain that here in a few minutes. Because you've already been declared righteous. Think about that. You've already been declared righteous. You've been pre-forgiven. 
That is, you've been forgiven before you even die and have to face the Lord. I got something interesting in the mail. You have been pre-forgiven. Open to find out. It's an insurance company. See what it says? Forgiven. The tag light structure. Listen this. You've been pre-forgiven. When you come to such and such insurance, you can be forgiven before anything even happens. If only all of life were like that, in parentheses. We offer accident forgiveness. For your first accident, we won't surcharge your policy. To go with accident forgiveness, there's also minor violation forgiveness. Even if the officer with the ticket isn't in a forgiving mood, you know that your insurance company will be. Not everyone is forgiving as this insurance company. It's all part of this insurance company where you customize your coverage to include only the features that you fit in your lifestyle. You can even get such and such with it. Call us today or contact us. You can find forgiveness with us. I got this in the mail a couple of weeks ago and I was reading ahead of this in the scripture and I thought, there's a good article. Pre forgiveness there. <laughs> it's kind of interesting because, but for the, you can be forgiven. We know that those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, when it comes our time we die or He comes ahead of time and we're still alive, you know that you're forgiven. You do know that, right? Okay, you are forgiven. But those who reject that offer of salvation through Christ, they would die. And then they're going to face eternal judgment and separation from God. Those that reject Christ as their Savior. But if you're a believer, your judgment's already been dealt with, your account's been settled, you'll die once and you'll spend eternity in the presence of God. That is a powerful thing to know if you're a believer in Christ. Now, let me point out that it says here we have three appearances of Christ. Look in verse 24. Talks about right through there. It says, He has appeared. See that in your scripture in verse 24? He has appeared. Or I'm sorry, verse 26. I'm sorry. He has appeared. This refers to the first advent when He came to earth to save us from the penalty of sin. This is a past tense of salvation. You were saved. Look at verse 24. It says, He now appears. This is a reference to his present ministry and the presence of God. To save you and I from the power of sin. That is a present tense of your salvation. Verse 28, it says that he will appear. You see those phrases I'm talking about? That he will appear. This speaks of his imminent return when he will save us from the presence of sin. He's talking about the future tense of salvation. So he has appeared, he now appears, and he will appear. Death. Death. The basic meaning of death is separation. Death never means in the scripture extinction or non-existent. Because you're going to live forever. Your spirit is. Your body might go, but your spirit's going to live forever. Either you're going to spend it with God in heaven, or you're going to spend it in hell. There's no in-between. The Bible does not teach purgatory. Okay? So you're either going to one place or the opposite place. Death is a separation from God. The Bible speaks of three deaths. I'm going to go through these kind of quick. The first is what we call physical death. When you as a believer, when you die, your spirit leaves your body. That's what's commonly called death, physical death. Okay, It's when a person ceases to exist on earth and then they're buried. That's physical death. Now listen to this. If you're a believer in Christ, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 22, So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, Adam... Now the resurrection from the death has begun through another man, Christ. Everyone dies because all of us are related to Adam, the first man. But listen to this. But all who are related to Christ, the other man, will be given a new life. Praise God. That's right. 
Hebrew, so in Hebrews 9.27, it says, It's appointed a man to die one time, then stand before God, give an account to his life. So for a believer in Christ at death, the soul of believers, the believers themselves, then they are made perfect in holiness, and then they enter right into the worshiping and the heavenly sanctuary. Is that powerful or what? So that's the death of a believer. You're closer to Christ. But then the second death is the spiritual death. That is of an unbeliever. That's the separation of a man's spirit from God while he's still living here on earth. How many of you know people that you try to share the Lord with, they don't want nothing to do with spiritual things? You bring it up to them, you say, hey, do you believe in God? Or what do you believe? And I want nothing to do with all that stuff. They're spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. It's hard to talk spiritual things to people that do not believe in spiritual things. And that's exactly what I was talking through here. This can even be with people that even come to church. There can be people that come to church. They may maybe they even pay their tithes. Maybe they even serve somewhere in the church. They do a lot of religious works but they've never had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can come to church and not be saved. As a matter of fact, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. Listen to this. I know all the things that you do and that you have a reputation of being alive. But you are dead. But you are dead. You can be physically alive, still doing things, but if you've never had a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, a person, you're spiritually dead. You're dead. That's the bottom line. And then the third death. So the first is physical death for a believer. Spirit leaves the body, goes to be with the Lord. The second death is the spiritual death of an unbeliever. He's just spiritually dead. Nothing interesting, or he doesn't want to hear anything about spiritual things. The third is what they call eternal death. That's of an unbeliever. This is the separation of man from God's presence forever. Forever. There's no second chance of being saved. If a person rejects the message of Jesus Christ and he dies, there's no second chance. Nowhere in Scripture does it talk about somebody can pray you in to heaven or they can pay enough money to get you into heaven. That's not scriptural at all. But a lot of you come out of that faith where you were taught that. But it's not true. There's nowhere in the Scriptures does it talk about you reap what you sow. This is just, As a matter of fact, for this to happen to an unbeliever, he dies two times. He dies the first time physically, but he dies the second time spiritually. Spiritually. Then he goes right into judgment. That is a tragedy of all tragedies. Is when a person dies and doesn't know the Lord as their Savior. He's going to be forbidden, or forbidden to ever enter into heaven. And then he's going to be cast into the place that's called hell. So judgment follows death. One day, a man was talking to an angel, and the angel says, What can I do for you? The man said, Show me the Wall Street Journal one year from today. This way, I'll know where to invest and will become a millionaire. How many times have we thought about that? (laughs) So the angel snapped his fingers, and out came a Wall Street Journal marked one year in advance of the date when they were talking. The man flipped the pages of the newspaper, studying all the listings, observing which stocks would be high and which ones would be low. But right in the midst of his joy, a frown came upon his face and tears began to roll down his eyes because when he looked over to the next page, he saw his face. It was in the paper under the obituary. Why did I tell you that story? (laughs) I just want to share with you. You can see that this life here that you and I live in today, it offers a lot. It offers us 
extremely a lot. But unless you live now in the light of eternity, you're just going to waste your time when you focus on earthly things. That's why at the beginning of the message I said, you're citizens of two worlds, earthly and you're a citizen of the heavenly if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. You and I need to live our lives as a Christian Focus on the things that matter to God. But we can only do this by walking in faith. By believing the things that we don't see. Not just believing in what we can see. You and I need to get so much of this in us that when something comes along and doesn't line up with this, the Holy Spirit within you, God's Spirit Himself, lets you know that this is not of God. And you and I need to start lining our lives up with the things that we know that we're pleasing. Because someday, if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, guess what? You're going to be worshiping God, not in this earthly sanctuary, but in the heavenly sanctuary. Amen? Let's pray.